as you prepare for the Inquisition here on a Thursday. And so we bring in our buddy from Pulso Sports and from the soccer bar, Nico Moreno, to ask the hard-hitting questions. John and Jared asking the hard-hitting questions. What's the mug and what cup of coffee are you on, sir, to start this segment? Hey, what's going on? John, Jared, SDH family. Uh, we are on cup number two. We got the Rafe Green mug right here, the ones that gets lost a little bit. <laughs> within the the magic of my background but yes we are uh cup number two lots to talk about we got some international games we have mls we're just excited to be on here guys all right so what i will do since jared is here i will yield the first question to jared underscore smith with nico as thursdays with nico begins right now all right, Nico, let's start with we're at the first international window. We've got three to four games under everyone's belt. People are feeling good, unless you're Miami, in which case your knees are probably hurt and you've got ice on them. Who's been your biggest surprise at this little first checkpoint? Uh, you mean uh, for MLS? For MLS, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Your first, your uh, biggest surprise in MLS so far. I mean, since I've touched on a few in the last couple of, of shows, uh, I'm going to swing right and um, I'm going to go with one that I had been critical of that has looked exciting, entertaining, dangerous. Um, they seem to really have their attack at least figure out. Uh, and that's the LA Galaxy. I, I really... Um, thought going into this year that we're going to need more time to settle in, to move on from Javier Hernandez, uh, to figure out exactly what went right, what went wrong last season. Not a lot went right. Uh, this was one of the worst defenses. This was a lackluster attack a, a lot of times. And this year, with Pencil on the right side, just uh, making it so easy for Delgado to be now the lead and assist uh, man for the league in general because all you have to do is put a ball in front of this man and he's going to drive it 30, 40, 50 yards and score. Um, he's just been a game changer. Uh, Ricky has uh, not taken on a new role, but I think he's taking his role more seriously. Maybe is the Ricky push in the back of the jersey instead of uh, Ricky or put what he had before in the back. Uh, he just seems so much more composed. He seems to be uh, getting on the ball a lot more. Love what Fagundes is doing on the left side. If you look at the first goal against St. Louis, I mean, it's a work of art, the buildup, the movement, uh, the stunt by Jovalic, who is now your leading scorer in MLS with four goals, or tied with, obviously, quite a few other players. But the stunt to go inside, I stay out. They find me in the back of the 18, in the 18, but a little bit farther back. Then I take the nice touch, give myself some space, put it away. Um, there is the Gabriel Peck um, possibility. So now you have depth, you're getting guys back. Um, so all in all, I'm not saying this LA team is uh, going to be unstoppable because you could see in this San Louis game that they still have some holes to fill. Um, they seem to generate a lot because uh, this could have very easily been a 5-3 game in favor of L.A. against St. Louis, but you got to fix some of those things in the midfield when it comes to uh, recovering, to closing down, to not allowing big lanes. Uh, but Yoshida gives them the draw there at the end of the game. So I really like what I'm seeing from a, a Greg Vanny team that we have been very critical of last season. So th they've been a nice surprise. They're a team that they're not my Atlanta, Orlando, Columbus, those teams that I have to watch. But I'm starting to, you know, if I have some extra time at night, uh, I'll put on a LA Galaxy game. Well, and with the uh, LAG, since we're talking about it, you know, P3, it is that power protein pack that a lot of folks can get, uh, you know, at the – you know, they, they can go to the Arco or they can go to they can go to Ralph's or Albertson's and, you know, on the checkout lane, they can grab that P3 and they can get it done. <laughs> and for for LAG right now, it is Paintsel, it is Pooj, and it is Gabriel Peck. And Paintsel came in once he was signed on Wednesday, came in on the weekend, and he already showed you that he was going to be trouble. He instantly hit fifth gear in, the, in that car and, 
you know, transmission didn't drop, oil didn't fall out, you know, the hood didn't pop up. He hit the ground running. LAG, they dropped, what, $19 million on Peck and Paintsel to bring in to help out Pooj and Greg Vanny. So far, so good to help out uh, Dejan Jovalich, the bishop up top. Yeah, and uh, to that is also uh, what I kind of mentioned in terms of depth, because now you have possibilities, you have options. Who are you going to be your two guys out wide? Are you going to maybe have times where you do bring Fagundes out? And Fagundes is a so versatile player who you could drop a line. So there's just so many things that you can do. Uh, Cerillo's been really good for this team, and now Bregman is coming back. Bregman is a must-start in my book. Uh, so now maybe Cerillo becomes the, the guy that's coming off the bench. Uh, so there's just – a lot of pieces that you didn't have last season. And when you have quality players, you have uh, dangerous dynamic players that can score, plus a good system, everything you do just becomes easier if you're Greg Vanny. So uh, quite honestly, if they can figure out how to be as dangerous on the ball but also be more disciplined on defense. This could be a team that might start to find a little bit of an identity and, and be a dangerous squad. So there's still things to fix, but I love to see an entertaining LA Galaxy, which we, just, we weren't able to say last year. No doubt about it. Jared, go for it. Let's go across town because I want to talk about the team that won a title two years ago, but LAFC just kind of – it feels like it's – I don't know. It feels to me like it's kind of getting a little stagnant right now. Like teams are sitting back more, not letting them have those transition opportunities. I know they've been linked this week. Uh, rumors being what they are to Olivier uh, Giroux, but mm -hmm. what's what's going on with LAFC? It just seems like it's something feels different and off, you know? Yeah, I, I just think they are taking it extremely slow, and maybe they didn't expect to be this low in the Western Conference table, and they didn't expect to not get as many results as they have. Um, but they have not ventured from their plan. They, they knew that they had the DP spots open. They knew that they were short in the roster. They understood that they the guys that they, they did pick up were younger guys that they were going to need a time to develop their prospects. So because of that, you've seen the lack of use of that bench by Chirundolo. You've seen the necessity for Christian Oliveira to be out there more, uh, for a guy like Ilya Sanchez to be out there a little more than you possibly wanted him to. Dennis Buanga, he's been good. He's, he's gotten to the final third, but he hasn't been as effective, as clinical in front of goal. So I am not um, in panic mode with this LAFC team. I think that they are playing to the rhythm of their drums. And right now they might be playing R&B, but, you know, give them a couple of weeks and they'll be hip hopping all around the league. So I really do believe that they are just kind of playing at their own beat. And once these players, you just mentioned Giroud, I mean, he gives them a whole different type of nine up top. And uh, maybe you're not as mobile when it comes to the movements that you have right now in that band of three up top, but you have a real goal scorer, which you haven't had in a very long time. Despite Buanga, I get it. He scored all the goals, but that's just not his role. I'm talking about the ninth position. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just think that once the rest of the roster gets filled, you'll start to see what this LAFC team is all about. It's just too soon for me to say, hey, we should start worrying about LAFC. Okay, because uh, I'll go there. Um, I mean, with La Banda being what it was in the past, and it was when Carlos Vela was obviously a lot younger, and, and Carlos Vela now at the age of 4,712 is, <laughs> is, is you know the starting striker for without Club FC. I, you know, when I look at LAFC and what we're seeing with Steve Chirundolo, it's an entirely different vibe now where, you know, offensively they're hiccuping and you don't know what you're going to be getting on a daily basis. And I think that Chirundolo at times seems to, he, he wants to, he wants to pull, he wants to pull back. He doesn't want to, you know, he, he, he wants to go up the hill and make sure that you're going up the hill in second and third gear. He's not mashing the, the, the gas pedal to the floor like we've seen in the past, it's almost trying to be more defensive in your posture, picking your spots, and it's like it's a different it's a different drive out there for LAFC, and I don't know what has gotten into 
Steve Chirundolo, he's coaching differently now with the offensive firepower that he has. I mean, is he waiting from window to window to see how I can, you know, put, you know, patches on the pipes under the sink and then try to figure out what's going on? It just seems like it's a different vibe now with Chirundolo coaching. Uh, well, yeah, th that's a good point. And maybe that's what Jared was alluding to. And uh, that is true. I, I want to say maybe halfway through last year, he started being a lot more pragmatic and playing what they say against the ball, right? We're going to just not necessarily possess it. We're going to be more direct. Uh, we're going to worry about just staying tighter down low. Uh, against Seattle, uh, in Seattle, you saw that if it wasn't because the Sounders didn't have an inform goal scorer uh one game one goal could have changed that entire game right because seattle had plenty of chances uh lafc was playing deeper was playing without possession so this season is more of the same right because uh, of maybe it is the style that churundola wants to take in maybe he feels like that's what's more effective for his team when you have guys like dennis buanga when you got guys like christian Oliveira that are so quick in transition um when you got a guy like Bogut that maybe playing that role as a false nine, maybe could be more used if we're playing uh, some of that counterattacking ball. So it could be that alone. Um, but again, I think that because of what we did see early in the season last year for this LAFC team, maybe it's just Chirundolo being able to specialize his team playing one way since he had already dominated the other and then he's going to have a squad that can play either type of soccer depending on the situation depending on the opponent um but to your point yes it is true he has been playing more against the ball than maybe we saw when he first started coaching lafc one question jared before i let you go oh, Lord. What'd you do? <laughs> Bruh broke his camera. Uh, uh, do you anticipate a, a Carlos Vela signing in Major League Soccer, or where do you anticipate Carlos Vela picking up uh, his next paycheck from other than uh, without Club FC? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I do expect him to stay in um, MLS. I still hold, not hope, but I, I still feel like LA is the place where he wants to be. Uh, <clears throat> I think all of us that have followed um his career here with mls and uh, you know just not off the, not on the field but off the field his family what he talks about his likes his dislikes he enjoys that la life right the the, the being able to go to the basketball games being able to uh, have his family there uh, he it's not a guy that I would see going to Mexico to play, although I guess I didn't think Javier Hernandez would ever go back to Liga MX. Um, but yes, I think that he ultimately will end up here. He has most of his value here. I think that there are teams that are interested, whether it's San Jose or Colorado or uh, LA. Uh, I think he'll, he'll end up staying in MLS. I, I don't foresee him going anywhere. I know that he had mentioned Spain that him and his wife would like to go back to Spain, go back to Europe. I also don't see that as a possibility. So I do think that MLS, the United States, is where he's going to end up in. Go for it, go for it Jared. <clears throat> as far as some of the projects that we have around the league that have been trying to get off the ground this year, you mentioned two of them. Like Colorado is trying to figure themselves out. Uh, it's, it's a whole new thing with Armas. I wanted to ask about San Jose if we want to stay in California for a moment, though, because like it, it, it ain't <laughs> San Jose is not it right now. How much of it is what he's got to work with, and is 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 Lucci in trouble, and how much of it is on him? I don't know if it's on him, but you know, if this is a project, this is uh, one of those buildings with half scaffolding and some trenches open on the side, and. There isn't really nobody working there. You just know that it has to be a project. Th that's kind of what I see from San Jose. I guess respectfully. <laughs> Maybe you can't be respectful after no, saying that. <laughs> but how can you be respectful for the guy that owns the Oakland A's? And it seems to be, I don't know if distracted is the right word, but he's more focused on moving his baseball team to Vegas. Vegas doesn't want him. And that seems to be where John Fisher seems to be spending most of his brain power these days. 
Yeah, I agree. And this ain't money ball team. This is this ain't a money team roster. I mean, it, it really is difficult to look at what Lucci has to work with and ultimately make him the scapegoat. I, I just I can't, right? I look at the roster. I I've said it three or four times in this show. You look at the departures last season and you look at the arrivals and you're like, man, what 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 were they doing? Right. I mean, there just isn't enough material for him to work with. And you can't just focus on Espinosa being the it guy every time and him to hold the entire responsibility of creating, finishing, being that it guy. Uh, the, I know that Judd is a good player, but he's just not a starter, right? He's more of a co-stellar piece, right? He's a guy that may be coming off the bench that maybe he needs other players around him. He, they just don't have him. Um, Ibogosi has kind of had to step back because of the same thing. You don't have enough service into you. You don't have enough people putting you in the right prime positions to score, not to mention how bad they're in the midfield, right? Uh, Gresso can only do so much. Yule's a guy that he's, uh, you know, medium tier when it comes to his position. So I just don't see the vision. I don't see the structure or what you're planning to do with this team. And I think that's the biggest problem, right? Because when we've had Almada here, we've had Lucci, we've had all these different coaches that have tried to work with what you have in San Jose. And it doesn't matter if you're good for two weeks, exciting for half a year, you just never go anywhere with San Jose. And that maybe has to do with ownership, that front office, more than anybody on the field, including the coaching staff. All right, so since we're on a roll here in the Western Conference, let me go to Portland. And Portland bringing in Jonathan Rodriguez from mm. Club America. That was a heavyweight pull. They needed some firepower up top, and so you bring in Jonah Rodriguez from Club America. What did you think about your rivals to the south there in Portland? Uh, I mean, you kind of saw it coming. I mean, it was written uh, in the water. Uh, they were going to get their – Liga MX striker, uh, no matter who it was, whether it was Herman or whether it was Cabecita, uh, they get Cabecita. It, it's uh, more of a win now move. And it's definitely a guy that he's not here to develop or grow or adapt. He's going to come here to score goals right off the plane. You know, as soon as he steps in, you're going to have the responsibility for the Hawaiian to put it away. And he's shown it. He's done it in Liga MX. He's a guy that um, is a great finisher. He has great tactical skills. He can link up play. Uh, he uh, has that confidence that you want in a striker where uh, it's going to be you miss a shot, you're going to put in three. Uh, I think he's going to uh, fit well with what Portland has been showing. The speed out wide, the service into him, uh, having a guy like Evander behind him, having a guy like Anthony next to him, having a guy like Moreno on the other side. Um, I really do think that he is a piece that is going to give this Portland team a big push in terms of caliber and eliteness. And because of that, that just makes them a big Western Conference contender to either stay in the high one, two, three spots, or why not just, just take the West? Uh, because, look, I understand that they haven't been brilliant, and I don't want to come over here and get on the bandwagon that this team is is amazing because they haven't been brilliant, but they've been effective, and they have showed character. And uh, for all the complaints and uh, things that I've said about Neville, he has been able to get this group going. He has shown that being a little bit of a motivator has gone long ways with this squad. They play more free. They've been able to, uh, you know, just simply show it to you on the field. So I think Cabecita is a perfect move for this team. And I think that it does put them uh, in, at the very least, in the conversation for a contender to win the West. I'll say that. Thursdays with Nico at El Rolo and W at the Soccer Bar and at Sports Pulso. Jarrett Smith, what's next on your mind for Nico Moreno? 
I know we didn't have any MLS teams in it this week, and we still got a little bit, a uh, little bit of magic and chaos left for tonight. But uh, any, anything to take away for you from the first few days of U.S. Open Cup, uh, with two teams in there, NISA teams in there, uh, a couple of amateur teams are moving on as well. I, I gotta be honest, I didn't see much of the U.S. Open Cup other than uh, the Ballard FC I, and Velocity. I, I, I figured you were. Keeping an eye on Ballard. I figured you were going to be looking at Ballard, the reigning USL League 2 champs. Yes, I would have loved to go down there to Memorial Stadium in the shadow of the Space Needle to watch this game. I just was unable to do so. My son had a game. But um, it is sad to see Ballard go because of the connections that they've kind of made, right? Riley, the coach, and... Nagel involved with the team in a general sense. Um, and then they lost to the velocity of Spokane, uh, which is sad. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I anal analyzed the game or that I watched the whole thing or anything. I was just keeping an eye on it. But um, if, if it comes to Open Cup, that's probably the one thing that I saw was just uh, Baller FC not being able to push through in their very first U.S. Open Cup game ever. Um, so sad to see them go. All right, so then let me go to the Eastern Conference before we get into a cliffhanger here for the week that will be. And there's going to be a lot of folks gone for international call-ups. Uh, Gonzalo Pineda, let me ask you about what you've seen and what you've thought about Atlanta coming out of the blocks with a full training camp with the guys that they brought in uh, in the summer window. Things you know seem to be humming. You're, yes, I know that you're taking care of business against teams that are playing in CONCACAF but you're still taking care of business. You put a four on New England. You got the win over the purple team, and now you've got a tough one going to Toronto. You don't know which Toronto you're going to get. They don't have Lorea, Osorio, or Davey Flores. This one will be intriguing, and I think it's going to be the offense of Atlanta or the offense of Toronto against the defense of Atlanta. What have you thought about Gonzalo Pineda and Atlanta United so far? I think they look good uh, watching that Orlando game and watching the uh, game against New England. If there's something – that stands out is that Pineda wants to get the team running and wants everybody to know exactly where they have to be when space opens up. Having a guy like Giacomakis and being as smart as he is and forcing teams to know exactly where he's at and demanding the type of marking that he demands is beautiful to watch. I mean, against Orlando, they've could have it could have been a, a four zero game, a 4-1 game, depending if Orlando gets kind of lucky on a couple of shots that they've had. But that's kind of what I see from them is just an idea, an ability to, at least on offense, get Wiley going, get Lennon going, uh, uh, create this, this advantage numerically and uh, push numbers forward, get Silva going. Uh, Saba, very smart player. You saw it in that first goal. Uh, when he sees that Giacomakis wins that ball, Giacomakis is servicing that's a masterpiece. And then Saba being able to kind of cut inside, break the guy's ankles and put it away. So do you see the components? I see the Pineda DNA within it, within the structure. So hoping that everything that we've been waiting Pineda to finally cement with his IQ, soccer IQ, plus the talent, I'm starting to see it. And look, I know people were freaking out with Colorado, the Colorado game, but that's a tough team to play, especially that early in the season. This g game against Orlando kind of shows you a little bit more. Is there kind of a undermark of saying, well, you know, this Orlando team struggled and they didn't have Araujo and they didn't have Cartagena? Sure. Yeah, th there were things that weren't there for Orlando, but ultimately is about how your team executes the game plan and they executed it beautifully so um i think that and you heard it from pineda himself defensively is the one side that they want to make sure to work with that's something that he hasn't been able to do since he arrived at atlanta that's always been a little bit of his own criticism within him he switches to a five-man back line because he saw he was given a lot of space out in wide positions he doesn't want to do that he says i want to defend better with the line of four so it's a work in progress defensively i think his final product offensively but all in all 
I am very hyped about this Atlanta team. I think they're going to be fighting the top of the East all season long. Um, and as long as no injuries happen and this team stays healthy, I think they're a big contender in the East. All right, so it's time for cliffhanger, but I want to focus on one game in particular, and it's the game at the end of the, uh, the, end of the schedule. And the reason I'm focusing on this one match specifically is because it is Jarrett's Quakes against, <laughs> against Seattle. Juice boxes in this one. San Jose, 1030, so a 1040 kick on, on Apple TV. San Jose is a plus 162 in the composite, courtesy of our friends at Odds Portal to get the win. Draws a plus 225. Seattle is a plus 171. Let me start with Jarrett here and get Jarrett's thoughts on this one with San Jose and Seattle. And this one is uh, right under the shadow of the San Jose airport. Jarrett, your early thoughts. I can't trust San Jose right now. I mean, we talked about it. It's a project. It's, it's a matter of them putting together a complete 90 minutes. We saw them play SKC last week. They got out in front. But they're right now they're lacking that consistency. They they're not putting their foot down on anybody's neck. But they, to get there in the first place, they have to be get up and stay up and try and control the game. Even when you're not controlling the ball, you have to be able to at least you'll get into the corner, get your hands up around your head, and then try and fight your way out of it at times. And right now, that's just not who they are. Uh, and I look, I know the Seattle team is a bit older. Uh, especially in those key pieces that we've known for years now. Um, feels like, like, feels like Raul Diaz has been there since 2015. I know he hasn't. It just feels like that in my head. Um, that's my head cannon. That's what I'll go with. But like, skepticism about Seattle aside, it's just, it, it is a Schmetzer team and it is a veteran team with young pieces that know the system. So, I mean, I'm not, taking i'm not taking san jose here because i think when push comes to shove one of these teams might flinch i think right now that san jose while they're trying to figure themselves out and seattle's even if they're not and i know nico you talked about you know seattle having someone finish consistently in front in front of net but i feel like they are more well equipped to not flinch if it gets close late yeah, no, I think that's a fair um, and very good analysis on what we might potentially see. Uh, the reason why I, I am more comfortable going with, with Seattle in this one is simply because they're dying for a win. I think that this team has been close to get one. It's been small things here and there against Colorado. It's uh, a red card by Joshua Tencio, a foul on top of the box by Leva, a ricochet that magically falls on Cabral. Nobody closes it down. It's a 1-1 game. So defensively, I feel comfortable saying Seattle is going to go to San Jose, not concede any goals. So they're going to be in the game for 90 minutes. Can they score? Can Jordan Morris and Raul Ridiaz find the right chemistry to not just get to prime scoring positions, but when they get there, can they put it in the back of the net? Um, I am of the thought process that at some point, I would love to see Jordan back on the wing, playing out wide. He's never been a guy that's just a goal scorer, and I feel like that's tough for him. He was asked this week if he felt like he was involved enough in the game. He responded that he wasn't, that he needs to get more on the ball. I don't think that his style of play benefits by him getting 17 to 20 to 25 touches a game because he needs to get on a rhythm. But just to stick to this particular game, guys are still missing. No JP for this one. Um, obviously, uh, Stefan Fry will be back, but that's in the back end. Albert will be back. We'll see how whether they start him, whether they're not. He only played a certain amount of minutes last week. So is he ready to start the game? I'm not quite sure. If we see the 4-4-2 again, I feel like this will be a very organized team that is going to be able to control the game, control the tempo of the game, control possession. But I don't know if they have that push. That said, because 
this team is so hungry for a win. I think they'll create enough to either get a foul in the box, get a foul around the box, and then maybe just get a goal in that nature. So I'm going to go with Seattle, but I'm not extremely confident that that's going to be the case. I do know they won't concede. The draw is probably your best bet on this one. If, if I'm a gambling man, which I am, uh, but you know, if you are getting some juice boxes on it, I will go for the draw. But here, with the analysis that I'm providing you, I think that Seattle will ultimately find spaces behind a midfield that has had issues this season in San Jose, holding back teams. Uh, I feel like maybe Leo Chu could find more space than he has lately on that left-hand side. And perhaps, just perhaps, the right pass gets done, right decision gets made, and Seattle gets a goal. All right, let's roll through the other matchups here in uh, Cliffhanger. And you, you hear something, go ahead and just yell stop, and we'll talk about it. Revs favored at home on the minus side hosting Chicago. Red Bulls favored at home against Messi and friends. Messi and friends are going to be and friends. And when you got Luis Suarez, it's not a bad <laughs> and friends to have. Get this. Messi and friends are a plus 202 going to uh, Harrison, New Jersey to take on Red Bulls. Charlotte really? at home, yeah. Ho Charlotte at home hosting Crew. Crew's a plus one forty-five on the road. Cincinnati on the minus side hosting NYCFC. Purple team heavy on the minus side. Austin FC visiting them at a plus three seventy-five. Toronto favored on the plus side at a plus one twenty-three hosting Atlanta, who's a plus two hundred six. Vancouver gets Vanny Sartini back. They're a minus one twenty-three hosting RSL. Let me ask you about Sporting and LAG. Sporting a minus one fifteen. LAG a plus 268, Ooh. and the draw is a plus 300. What do you think? Man. Uh, ooh. That woke him up. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the draw is, like, I mean, that, that number for the draw is crazy. Uh, but I'm going to have to go with the LA Galaxy, man. Look, I know Sporting Kansas City has also looked good. Uh, I like what Rosero's done. He seems like he's finally completely became the man of that back line for Sporting Kansas City. But there's just too much firepower for LA Galaxy. Uh, I don't know if Sporting Kansas City has enough firepower to match that. They're not going to go blow for blow, or, or they just don't have the jab power uh, or hook power. So I'm going to go ahead and take the LA Galaxy on this one for sure. That's that that's some nice numbers there. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, figured you'd dig that one. All caps, even money plus 100 hosting DC United, Colorado, and the Rabid Prairie Dogs are favored against Houston Dynamo. LAFC heavy on the minus side of minus 172 hosting Nashville, who's north of plus 450. And Ooh. Portland. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> look, look, I am the resident Nashville hater, but that's a number. <laughs> yeah. Uh, draws a plus 311 in the composite. Nashville's a plus 454 on the road at LAFC. And then uh, Portland is hosting Philly. Portland is a plus 116. Philadelphia is a plus 211 on the road. Your draw is a plus 266. Nico, what's going on with Pulso Sports and the soccer bar? And I imagine that soccer bar, somebody's, you got, you got another conversation to have in about 50 minutes. Uh, I, I will not. Uh, I am, um, I, I want it to be, but we've had um, a very heavy schedule coming up. We all have things to do. John is going to be in Portland at the uh, Cabecita uh, presentation. Uh, I have something going on with the Sounders as well. So we're not going to have a show today, but we'll definitely be back on Monday. Uh, do look at uh, Pulse of Sports for everything that's going on this week. The biggest thing is Alex Roldan telling expressing his frustration with the El Salvador Federation. He completely um, pulled away from the national team. He told us that he's no longer going to be playing for that national team. It's created a huge boom in El Salvador because those who don't know, that federation hasn't even cared enough for players to provide the most minimal things for them, logistics, a jacket to wear in cold weather. I mean, just the simplest thing. So Christian, I mean, uh, Alex being the person that he is, he didn't go and tell like, anybody or, or, or the press exactly all the problems, but we know the problems. All he's saying is I'm, I'm, I'm not committed completely. And if I'm not committed, I'm not going to go. I'm going to, I'm going to give 
that space, that opening, that chance to someone else. And I'm frustrated with how things are handled down there. So uh, go ahead and check that out. It's, it's great to just hear him as young as he is, be as wise as he is, and to take on a bad situation forward to the point that it's created a huge, 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 huge conversation around the real issue in El Salvador. Not the fact that he's not going to play, but the fact that so many players are willing to not play because of the issues with the Federation. So check that out at Pulso Sports for sure. No doubt about it. As always, my friend, enjoy your second cup of coffee, and we will catch up with you next week. May you be safe. May everything uh, stick to the recordings and the tapes and the cards, and we'll catch up with you next week, my friend. Thanks for hanging out. All righty, guys. Have a good one.